Det har vi. Chris, kom op på stage, Chris. Og Chris, han bor i Oxford. Han har seks børn og en kone. So Chris, it's uh, you have six children and, and one wife. <laughs> That's right. And she's home alone with all the kids. Oh no, I've left her alone at home with six children. Yeah. Wow. So an, an impressive wife. Very impressive yeah. wife. And uh, you're a former uh, president of School of Theology in London. That's right. And now you're heading up uh, an organization called Home for Good. Yes, Home for Good's a, a charity designed to find foster and adoptive homes for all the children in the UK that need one. Oh, that's beautiful. So, uh, on your homepage, uh, on your webpage, it says that you're an author, a speaker, and an activist. And I'm, I'm really happy that you're going to serve us in that way, as both a speaker and an activist. So you're going to engage us both with your intellect and with your example. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So let's let's pray for you, and then we'll hand the stage over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah. God, we just uh, pray for Chris now. We pray that you will bless him with... Uh, with energy, with, you know, energy, with a calm spirit, and, and uh, calm with spirit, wisdom, and uh, with wisdom, and we just pray that he will be able to open the word of God for us this morning. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's great to be here. I've been in Denmark be for one I've day Denmark before I came this time, and I came, I came, I came to Copenhagen, came beautiful to city. Copenhagen. Anyone here from Copenhagen? Anyone here Excellent. From Copenhagen? Well, I'm hoping to get to know the rest well, of you, and I am a bit of a, a, an addicted a person to social media. Person to social so if media. you have any comments, so if you want to make the Bible comments, teaching better, you the Bible you have a question, better, uh, then please make use of social media to reach out to me. Uh, on the screen are my details. Uh, I use Twitter a lot, so at Chris K is my address. Now, can you understand my accent okay? I'm from England, so we speak funny. I apologize. Uh, I know you might understand American is better than British people, but I, my American accent is terrible. So I'm going to try and speak English. Um, I must apologize for the UK. We have left Europe or have decided to leave Europe. Can, can I just say... It, it say, wasn't my fault. It, it wasn't my fault. It, I, I voted to stay, but voted not everybody stay, listened. Not everybody listened. But we do have a problem at the moment. We do have a problem. Um, not just in England or, or, uh, or uh, in America, in America or, uh, but we live in, in increasingly divided societies. Divided societies. The divide between the rich and the, 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 the poor, between, between black and and white between migrants and citizens and so it's very important we're looking at this book of Ephesians it has something very powerful to say not just to us as the church but to our nations so my prayer is as we open up the book of Ephesians God would speak to us Jesus would surprise us and together we might learn how to serve him effectively in the world not just in our hearts but in the world now, you might be wondering where I'm from. I said I was from England, but to be honest, I don't look like an Englishman. My ancestry is a little bit complicated. My father was born in Malaysia, but his father was born in Sri Lanka. My mother was born in India. And as you probably guessed, her father was from Ireland. So I, I, I call myself Irish, so just, I, I to myself Irish just to confuse people. I do have one wife, and she is half wife, English and, and half Welsh. Half English Maybe you've heard Welsh. of the Welsh, they're pretty Maybe good at football. Yeah, I, I gave up my English yeah. ancestry I, while I the Euros English were on because England was terrible. But, England but a little terrible. bit better than you, so but, that's, but that's okay. <laughs> So in my family, we have six children, so family, have three six are children. our birth children, three, three are adopted, children, three are and so adopted. we have a little bit of the United so Nations in our family, and so the Olympics is going to be complicated, so be complicated because everybody's complicated. cheering for a different country, for a different but country. in one sense that's good, isn't it? But in one we sense are the United good. Body of Christ, United and together we stand. Independent of our nationality or our ethnicity, we are one people. 
And maybe you picked up on that a little bit yesterday. Maybe a good way to introduce myself uh, would be to show you um, a little video. I hope this is just gonna, gonna work. Let's see if it's gonna, gonna happen. Struggled to understand God. As a child, I remember sitting on a shrunken plastic chair with my hand in the air and my toes hovering above the floor. Who made God, miss? Is God bigger than the universe? Why does God tell Abraham to kill his son? Will he tell me to hit my mate? If I do hit my mate, then isn't it really God's fault? Because he's in charge of the universe. Paradoxes, mysteries, conundrums. The Christian faith is full of them. My Sunday school teacher always had an answer. If we could understand God, then we would be God. God works in mysterious ways. Don't be awkward, get on with your colouring. One of the paradoxes of faith is that years of living the Christian life and studying the Bible do not give us immunity from those bothersome questions. The more I know, the more I know I don't know. So I still struggle with those same questions I had when I was six years old. Where is God? What is he really like? Does God really care? Sometimes I sit in a study surrounded by books, or in a church service surrounded by worshippers, or in a hospital surrounded by tragedy, and those questions still bother me. My Sunday school teacher's easy answers are no help at all. I need more than an easy answer, a handy proof text, or a trivial distraction. Our Bible heroes didn't archive their difficult questions or sweep them under the carpet. Moses asked, where is God? David demanded, why God? Habakkuk complained, really God? Job debated, does God really care? Paradoxes, mysteries, conundrums, all dared to be brought out into the open to God himself. So what I want to ask is, what if we've been going about this all wrong? What if we've settled for neatly packaged, simplistic answers? instead of seeking out the deep and rich realities of our faith? What if it is actually in the difficult parts of the Bible that God is most clearly revealed? What if it is in and through our struggles and doubts that we learn the meaning of a true relationship with God? What if this ancient faith we call Christianity has survived so long, not in spite of, but precisely because of its apparent contradictions? What if Christianity was never meant to be simple? I've always struck. I've always struck. I was the awkward boy I in Sunday school with all the questions. And uh, I did have a very gracious and Sunday school teacher, but I did ask a lot of questions. And I want to encourage you to ask questions this week. Whether that's through social media, uh, or whether we have a chance to come around with a microphone, that this shouldn't just be a one-way conversation. Me telling you what the Word of God says. I believe by the grace of God, each one of us is connected to the Father. And so therefore, it's great if you bring a question or a comment from your uh, context and experience. So hopefully we'll have a chance to do that. The book Paradoxology is my latest book, and by the grace of God, they've translated it into Danish. So if you can't understand my accent, you could buy the book and sit at the back and read it. That may be another way of uh, enjoying our time together. Well, let's take a look at uh, the book of Ephesians. Um, Ephesus no longer exists as a city. It's now an archaeological site. But back in the day, it was one of the most important cities in the, the cities in the Roman uh, world. Because of its location, of its it, was location it was a major port, a major centre of industry. Port, and, so and so the world's cultures passed, passed through Ephesus. Passed through it was Ephesus. famous for having one of the biggest temples to Artemis, a female goddess. And that's going to weave into some of the things that we look at during this week. And uh, just in case you can't see where we are, there you are. So uh, we're on the edge of the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, a place of, of great people movement right now, actually, even though Ephesus doesn't really exist as a city. But before we can zoom down into Ephesians 2, which we're going to look at this morning, we need to ask some bigger questions. It's a little bit like joining a box set halfway through. 
Uh, I don't know which is your favourite box set out of that. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of The Killing. Hands up if you've seen The Killing. Yes. Scandi Noir, I love it. Um, I'm hoping one day to get into Borgen. I've not got into Borgen yet. Uh, is it good? Uh, is Excellent. It good? Okay, I'll, I'll save up for that one. That would be okay, great. I'll save up um, but imagine that you joined uh, in uh, the killing at episode 17. You would have no idea of what's going. You, you might get some of the jokes, but you'd miss most of what was going on. And so before we can dive into Ephesians 2, we need to look a little bit wider to see what else has been happening. And so let me give you a little bit of an overview. Previously in the book of Acts. Let's see where we've come from. So in Acts chapter 19, Paul arrives in Ephesus. And he's, he, he comes across some believers. They are believers in the baptism of John. So they've had water baptism, but they don't yet know about the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul has to help them. And they come to a living and vibrant faith. And then Paul goes into, as his normal practice, the Jewish synagogue. Because the Jewish nation were the, were the first nation to have a, a revelation from God. They have been prepared for the gospel for generations. And so Paul's practice was to go first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And so he tries, because as a Jewish man preaching to his compatriots, he pleads with them to believe the gospel. But after a while, some are getting converted, there's, there's a problem, and so he has to move into a public space. And so he used to lecture day by day in a public lecture hall, a little bit like a university. It's interesting, isn't it? Often we think the gospel is something reserved for the church. But from its earliest days, the church was bringing the gospel into the public realm. It wasn't something to be hidden. It was something to be brought out into the open. And so day by day by day, Paul preaches in Tyrannus' lecture hall. So many people are getting converted um, that some miraculous events start to occur. Some manifestations of the Spirit, unusual ones. And, and there's even a bit of a problem. In fact, so many people see miracles that a guy comes along and says, you know what, I'm going to have a go. And so he says, in the, in the name of the God of Paul... Uh, he tries to command some demons to leave. And the demons say, well, we've heard of Paul and we've heard of God, but who are you? And chase the man out of the house. It's some fascinating reading. But all of this activity, the preaching of the gospel day by day by day, systematic exposition, appealing to the mind and the heart, and then also the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. These two things, word and spirit working together, is explosive. And hundreds and hundreds of people become converted. And they bring out all of their um, paraphernalia, all the things they use to worship the goddess Artemis. And they burn them. And many, many thousands of pounds or krona or euros uh, worth of um, paraphernalia are burnt. And this causes problems. And so all the people who make money out of these religious symbols start a riot. And Paul, preaching the gospel, demonstrating the power of the Holy Spirit, causes such a commotion that he has to leave the city. And so he tries to write to them in the book of Ephesians to encourage them in the gospel that he first sought to bring to them. And so this is his, it's a heart letter full of, of passion. There doesn't seem to be any major problems going on in the church. This is a letter to encourage them to stay faithful to Jesus. So let's zoom in to Ephesians chapter 2. And if you have a Bible, brilliant, please open it so you can follow along with me. Um, if you don't have a Bible but you have a smartphone, that's great, get that out and let's use that together. I, I find it a little bit funny that I am scrolling through the Bible, just like they used to in the first century when the Bible was written on scrolls. It feels like we've gone back in time a little bit. But Ephesians chapter 2, let me read it to you, and then uh, we'll make some comments together. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. 
all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In the Anglican church, they say, this is the word of the Lord. And you say, thanks be to God. Let, let's try that. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So when I became a Christian, I'd kind of done it all. I'd had quite a difficult um, and tempestuous life up until that time. I, I was into some pretty heavy things. I was into Lego and Playmobil. <laughs> my Christian journey started when my mother allowed me to go to church when I was seven years old. I, I had heard an earthquake coming towards my house, a big booming sound was resonating through my neighborhood. And I looked out of the window and I saw the marching band of the Salvation Army. Have you heard of the Salvation Army? They have a big bass drum and they were banging it and marching and, and, and using all their uh, musical instruments. And when you're seven years old, that is the coolest thing anyone has ever done. And so I asked my mother if I could go where that band was going. And so she let me come to church, and I, I was there. I was the brownest boy in our Sunday school. And as I told you before, I was the awkward one asking the questions. And at the age of seven, I made some kind of profession of faith. Uh, I knelt at the front of the church, and an elderly woman counseled me to give my life to Jesus. I had done some heavy stuff, Lego and Playmobil. Now, for some of us, we're a little bit embarrassed about our testimony, about the story that brings us to faith. We think it's not exciting. It's not like I was in a motorbike gang, or I was murdering people, or I was dealing drugs. And so no one will be interested in my story because I did Lego and Playmobil. It's just not exciting. Maybe you feel the same way. Maybe telling other people about the story of God's intervention in your life seems like it's too mundane, it's too boring for anyone to be interested in. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 gives you a perspective on why your story of grace is worth sharing. And he does that by doing a before, a now, and an after picture of who we are in Jesus. I don't know if you noticed it. Have a look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 again. This is Paul's description of all of us, whatever age we were before we became believers. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature. Friends, your story is a resurrection story. You and I, we were dead. We were spiritually closed off to God. But then God stepped in. We were spiritually dead. We were slaves to the spirit of the air, another word for the devil. We were following the ways of the world, and we were obedient to the cravings of our flesh. Uh, in some theological traditions, they talk about uh, the, the, the devil, the world, and the flesh as the biggest enemies to our souls. 
And according to Ephesians 2, that is what all of us were subject to. So your story is a resurrection story, and no resurrection story is a boring one. I remember when I was uh, living in London, I was a pastor of a church. And um, we had a little website for our church. And we said, if you want to pray for anything, just send us an email or a message on the website and we will pray for you. And so one day we got an email from a man who had just moved to our area. And he said, look, I have nowhere to live. I've just moved here from India. Please could you pray that I get somewhere to live? Now, my wife has a big heart, and so she said, well, why don't we invite him to live with us? And I'm like, no, you know, where's he been? What's he, where's he from? This could be dangerous. But he came to have an interview with us, and uh, we were going to decide whether we were going to welcome him into our home as a lodger. And uh, I explained that we were Christians, and he says, this is wonderful news. My family are Hindu, but my, my auntie... Well, she died. And, um, and then, you know, some people in a church, they prayed for her, and now she's alive. And so I, I really want to meet some Christians to find out more about the Jesus that can raise the dead. And I'm thinking, God, I wonder if we should have him in our house or not. <laughs> I, I wish you could make it a little bit clearer, because I, I'm not certain. I've never seen a resurrection from the dead, but here is a man that says that's what happened to his auntie. Wow. I'll tell you more about his story. Uh, I think the day after tomorrow, I'll resume that story. But your story is a resurrection story. You and I, we were as far away from God as it was possible to get, and yet God reached out to us and brought us to life, gave us a hope, a chance, and a future. We cannot be ashamed of our story because it is to the glory of God that we share it. Most people that you know, chances are, have not been in a motorcycle gang. They have not been hooked on drugs and they haven't killed anybody. Most people in your circle of friends have similar lives to you. That's the way that social demographics work. And so you being open about your story of God's grace is actually probably the most effective way that they will hear the gospel. So please don't be ashamed. This passage helps us understand two problems that are going on in the church today. I want to talk to you about a certain group of Christians which are what we might call grace ditchers. They are living without grace in their lives. And there's another group of people in the church called grace hoarders. They are storing up grace, but not doing very much with it. I want to show you how those two things relate and then offer you a way forward. But again, let me show you a little video to kind of help you understand how the grace ditches uh, work. So that's where we're going, but hopefully, yes. Okay. You have to bear with me with this video. It's very English humor. And this is a little bit of a test to see whether Danish humor and English humor are compatible, okay? So if you laugh, I will know that we are on the right wavelength. If you don't laugh, I'll, I'll show you different kinds of videos as the week go on. <laughs> okay, let's hope this will work. You ready? Can I get you a drink? Yeah, something soft, I'm driving. Parking's an absolute nightmare around here, isn't it? Had to reverse into the tiniest of spaces. Still, I managed it, I mean. Parking's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> and I should know. <laughs> Why is that? Are you a doctor? Careful. Not a doctor. I'm a brain surgeon. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah, I actually know a joke about this. What's the difference between a doctor and a brain surgeon? One's not exactly brain surgery. The other is brain surgery. <laughs> um, so, uh, what do you guys do? I'm an accountant. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I could do with an accountant. Filling in those tax forms can get really confusing, can't it? Still, it's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> I mean, brain surgery, believe me, is very complex. Are you an accountant too? Uh, no, I work for a charity. Oh, that's a very selfless job, isn't it? I really admire you. I don't think I could ever do what you do. I say that because it's emotionally draining, not because it's hard. 
I mean, it's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> Which, as a brain surgeon, is what I do. Lionel, here's your drink. Lionel's a brain surgeon, you know. <laughs> yeah, he mentioned it. Oh, Jeff, I keep you late at the Space Centre. As always. Uh... And this food round. Uh, have you met Lionel? Uh, no, hello, Lionel. So, Jeff, how do you earn a crust? Uh, well, I'm a scientist. I, I work mainly with rockets. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it's pretty tough work. Um, what do you do? Why, well, I don't mean to boast, but uh, I'm a brain surgeon. Brain surgery? <laughs> Not exactly rocket science. Isn't it? Sounds like you understand British humour. I think we're going to be fine. Sometimes Christians can be those annoying people at parties that look down on everyone else. We live as if we're morally superior to the rest of the world. That we're somehow the best and, and, and most honoured people on the planet. And everybody else is somehow below us. We live with a moral superiority that is ugly. Maybe you've seen it in the media sometimes, that Christians stand up and, and condemn other faiths. Uh, we're, we're judgmental towards people who don't practice or share our moral values. We have ditched grace. For many people around the world, that is the normal picture of the Christian life. They, they did a, a survey of 16 to 29 year olds in the US and they asked these teenagers and young adults, what is the first word that comes into your mind when you hear the word Christian? Can you guess what it was? Boring? Judgmental was number two. The first one was anti-homosexual. The second one was judgmental. The third one was uh, that we were hypocritical. That is what the world thinks about us. It's, it's true in the UK. I don't know if it's true in Denmark. They think that we are somehow morally superior, or we think that we're morally superior. But this passage from Ephesians must undo this way of thinking. Have a look again. Paul says, all of us, all of us were dead in our transgressions and sins. Not just some of us, not just some of us from difficult backgrounds, but even the middle class ones, even the wealthy ones, even the educated ones. All of us were dead in our transgressions and sins. All of us were slaves to the, to, to the devil, to the ruler of the kingdom of the air. All of us lived for our own personal gratification. And yet God, and yet God stepped in by his grace to transform us. We cannot be graceless Christians. We cannot live in a judgmental posture to the world. One Sri Lankan theologian said this, a, a Christian is like a beggar, a, a, one beggar who has found some bread and is trying to share it with another. That is our experience, isn't it? We are not acceptable to God because of our good deeds, because of our our high moral values, because of our education, because of our clean living. We are acceptable to God because of his grace. Now, the equal and opposite danger of graceless Christianity is grace hoarding Christianity. That we want grace for ourselves, but we don't really want to share it with anybody else. We enjoy Christianity that pleases us, but we don't seem to do anything with the grace that we have received. In the UK, we had an Archbishop of Canterbury that said this. He said, the church is the only institution that exists for the benefit of non-members. Shall I say it again? The church is the only institution that exists for the benefit of non-members. Now, I am a Baptist. And so I agree with 99% of what my Anglican brothers believe. But this time, this Archbishop of Canterbury got it wrong. Because in the UK, we have another institution that exists for the benefit of non-members. It is called the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. 
Do you know what a lifeboat is? When someone is drowning in the sea, they call the emergency services and they release a lifeboat into the sea. It's a charity that runs to rescue people. Now, I want you to imagine something. Imagine that this great charity has hit some financial problems. And so the directors of the charity meet together and they have a long meeting. And they say, we, we cannot get enough money to sustain the lifeboat. And we are asking people to do a lot of very tough things. We're asking our volunteers to be aw uh, uh, available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is a very high cost to be a part of the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. I think we should change things up. I think we should become a 21st century charity. And so after a very long meeting, they decide to sell the rescue boat. This is costing us too much to run, so we will sell the rescue boat. And we will invest the money into building a lovely clubhouse for our members. And at this clubhouse, we will put the amazing visuals in. We'll, we'll get a nice projection screen and we'll get a surround sound system. And instead of asking people to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we will just ask them to turn up for one hour a week. Let's call it Sunday mornings. And people will come in and they will sit in very comfortable seats. They will listen uh, to the amazing audio visuals. We will sing the songs that sailors sing when they're on the seas to remind us of the days when we used to have a rescue boat. And after the hour, we will ask people to put some money in a collection and then everybody can go home. Does this remind you of anything? For some of us, Christianity is all about us. We are upset if our church buildings are a bit drafty, or if the speaker is not exciting, or if the music is not uplifting enough, or if the visuals are a bit, you know, boring. We've turned the rescue mission that God has sent his church on into a, an hourly meeting that we turn up at once a week. We have become hoarders of the grace of God. But that was not God's intention. Have a look at Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, let's look at 8 to 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. You cannot be that ugly guy at the party who looks down on everybody else. It is by the grace of God you have been saved. But, verse 10, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You were not saved by your works. God looked at you and loved you, whatever you've done, whatever your history, whether you did Lego and, mobile, uh, and, and stickle bricks, or whether you did do drugs and murdered people, God says, I will save you from your sins by my grace. But having received that grace, God says, now I have prepared good works for you to do. I have a purpose for you in the world. You cannot just hoard this grace to yourselves. I used to study chemistry. That was my subject at university. I remember my first lecture in the chemistry hall was quite scary because they showed us what happens if you didn't tie your hair back and you lit a Bunsen burner. And so there was a, an amazing visual of a woman with her hair on fire for my first chemistry lesson. They showed you what happened if you did an infusion experiment and you forgot to take out your contact lenses. They showed you a contact lens being melted onto your eyeball. It was amazing studying chemistry. <laughs> my wife, she was my girlfriend then, she was studying German. And uh, I said, look, the only thing that you can die of in your lectures is boredom. Well, we could have our hair set on fire or we could have our eyeballs melted. This is a really exciting subject. Now imagine, imagine, 
in my chemistry lab that I came across the cure for cancer. I did it. I found it. I found the cure for cancer. Imagine I took that cure and I just stuck it in my back pocket and I said, well, that's great. If ever I get cancer, I will be fine. Friends, if this gospel that has saved us stays with us and does not get communicated out to others, we have betrayed the grace of God. We cannot live graceless Christianity condemning other people, but we cannot live a grace-hoarding Christianity that condemns other people because we refuse to share the grace that has been freely given to us. Paul is trying to encourage this church in Ephesus to live for the purposes of God, to walk in the good deeds that God has prepared in advance for them to do. Friends, where is God sending you? To be involved in the mission of God is not necessarily to, to get in a plane and go to the other side of the world. It could be to cross the road and talk to one of your neighbors. It could be to cross the office and to share something of the grace of God with a colleague. It could be in your, in your home life to demonstrate the grace of God to family members. We cannot live a graceless Christianity and we cannot live a grace hoarding Christianity. As we reflect now, where is God sending you with the grace of God? Can I invite you to stand for a moment if you're able? I'm going to say a prayer and then I'll hand back to Lars for our next reflection. Father God, we thank you that even though we were dead in our transgressions and sins, by your grace, you reached out and you rescued us. Thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross that meant that we could be rescued from the world, the flesh, and the devil. But now, Lord, help us to live as men and women saved by grace. Help us to find ways to share that grace with a needy world. In the name of Jesus, amen.